So I'm reading in uh, <clears throat> in 1 Kings. I was reading Jeremiah, and I'm reading this commentary from the Moody Bible Institute. Um, it's, it's a really useful Bible commentary. There's a lot of well-written commentary, uh, explanations, some hints and clues, and uh, even some references to other parts of the Bible where something might be speaking about a certain thing. And uh, I'm reading Jeremiah, and, and it's talking about God's judgment. That's pretty much the whole book of Jeremiah. And it, it's, it references something back to uh, the idolatry that, that Israel was performing, was participating in. And it runs it back to uh, Solomon's idolatry, uh, pointing out that Solomon built this, this high place, this place of worship, this altar, unto this foreign god, not to the Lord God himself, but unto a wicked god, a wicked idol of another nation. And, and I was just baffled by that, because I guess I haven't read into uh, Solomon's doings in a while. I haven't read into One Kings in a little bit. So uh, I was reminded of that incredible passage where Solomon went in a wicked direction, according to God. So in 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 4 to 8, uh, it, it talks about the fact that Solomon did what God never commanded him to do. He took wives from other nations. He had 700 wives. That's, uh, that's obnoxious. That's an, an, an unbelievable amount of responsibility and an impossible amount of, of faithfulness. Uh, one wife to every man is more than enough, and it's the greatest challenge and blessing to love that woman the way Christ loved the church. That's another topic, but more than one is, is, is disrespectful to both, uh, and it's not honoring of God, because God never said that you can ever love more than one. He never said, a man shall leave his mother and his father and be married to his wives. He said, he shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. They, just the two, just the man cleaving unto the woman, and the woman cleaving unto the man. So, Solomon's idolatry. He began marrying all these women from different nations, and they all have their spiritual practices. So, their spiritual practices should have been avoided. That's why God said, don't marry them from these other places because they're going to turn your heart away. God warned him and he didn't take it seriously. So 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 4, it says, For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians or the Zidonians, and after uh, Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did, his, as did David his father. So there's, a, there's an important concept there because uh, going perfectly after the Lord does not mean you are a perfect person. It means your whole heart is devoted to God. So you realize the things that are terribly <laughs> horrible to ever do against God, and, and you know what it means to repent. You actually have conviction when you are straying, whether it comes through the mouth of another person, whether it comes through a preaching at a Sunday or a Thursday or a Monday night service, whether it comes from something you read in the Word of God, whether it comes from just a, a beautiful gift of an epiphany that God gives you saying, what are you doing? Uh, no matter how it, it, it comes your way, whether a radio, a TV show, something, uh, if God reminds you and convicts you and gives you that confrontation saying, I, I want you to get this right, stop, what are you doing? Or that, that really gentle yet powerful and effective reminder saying, is this what I told you to do? Uh, that is a time of repentance. When you get that, repent. You're going to lose stuff to repent. You're going to lose friends. You're going to lose money. You're going to lose things you've invested in. You're going to lose comforts. You're going to lose people's uh, respect because they respect your leniency and you're gonna start being straightforward. So they're gonna start being like, yo, you're too star you're stubborn, you're too strong in this, you're, you're, too, uh, you, you, you're, too, you're too rigid, you're, there's no flexibility with you. It's like in some areas, there's no reason to have any flexibility in some things. There is no gray area with God, but there is grace 
That doesn't mean gray areas. That doesn't mean you can meddle with sin and be cool with God. You're meddling with sin, you're already saying, God, let me just smack you in the face every once in a while. It's literally offensive to God. It's a straight up disrespect to him because he gave you your body. He gave you your life. He gave you the choice and he promised that the wrong choice will send you in a direction down to hell. And if he doesn't intervene, you will end up in hell for eternity. So he gave you this awesome opportunity. Everybody living in this age has the opportunity to repent because Jesus has already died on the cross. Cross. He's already paid the full penalty, but that doesn't mean you're already on the right path. That means you need to get on that path because it's been opened up by Jesus' sacrifice. The door has been opened. You got to walk through it. Every person from birth till death is already walking in the wrong path until they turn to Christ. Nobody's born a Christian. Nobody is already on the right path because somebody decided that uh, infant baptism got them saved. Infant baptism is nothing. It does nothing for anybody. It makes the parents proud of a decision that has no effect in God's eyes. Because God says, repent and believe and be baptized in the name of Jesus. An infant has nothing to repent of even though it is born in sin. It's still not deciding to sin. There is still no decision of disobeying God or their parents at a stage in infancy. That's not something that infant can do. Also, the child cannot put their faith in anything because all they know is craving milk and sleep and playfulness. That's all that infants know. Now, I'm not saying they're stupid, but they're unintellectual. They're, they're still ungrown. They're still immature. They, they have nothing yet. There's no area for them to put their faith in God, to express that faith, to recognize sin, uh, and to recognize their own dependence on God. All they depend on is the food. All they depend on is the, 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 the water, the liquid, whatever, the warmth, diaper changes, and some intimacy. That's, that's, that's what infants need. That's why parents have to stay up at ridiculous hours of night taking care of every little whim of that child. Infant baptism does not get the baby saved. So if your infant baptism is the only baptism you can account for, you still have to walk down that aisle with God. You still have to confess your sins to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not because someone told you to, but because you realize it's the right thing to do. Then you have to turn your life over to God and to make a public confession. And that is when you walk down the aisle to, to mirror maybe a marriage ceremony. You walk down the aisle and you're with God now. And somebody walks you down, maybe a pastor, a friend, somebody that's led you into the faith. And, and then you make a public confession that you are now marrying God. You are now becoming one with God. You are now surrendering your life into the hand, into the care, under the authority, and with reverence to Jesus Christ, the Lord God. And in his name, you are getting baptized, being completely submerged in water. Completely submerged. Baptism means submerged. It means completely submerged. Being completely submerged in water while the name of Jesus is being proclaimed over your life as a symbol and an acknowledgement and and, and a, a, sta a statement of, you can hold me accountable now, church, to the law of God, to the word of God, to the Bible, to the standards, to the uh, expectations, to the limits, to the rules, to the boundaries, and to the blessings of the Bible, because that's the word of God. The same way a man makes a public confession with his woman in front of everyone, saying, you know, hold me accountable. You know, I'm not going to go messing around with other people. Single ladies, stay away from me. If it's coming at me from that way, don't come at me sideways like that. You know, I'll respect everyone, but I'm not going to be flirting with no other girls. I'm making a public confession. She's not my wife. No playing around, not cheating. I'm going to be 100% with her. Everyone is now aware of this. That's what a marriage is. It's making a public confession to love that person through faults, illnesses, struggles, less and more, no matter what or to what degree. It's a public confession, and it should be a faithful one, otherwise your marriage is a joke. And that's not going to be good for anybody. So, so where we're at right now is there's a lot of people that don't realize that uh, if, they, if they make a commitment to God or if they make some kind of a decision to walk with God, He's going to give them limits that are reasonable, they make sense, and sometimes they're different from anything you'll see on this earth. A limit to uh, the way you should interact with people that offend you. The limit is you can't cuss them back and be right with God. You're going to have to ask for forgiveness at some point for that. A limit to uh, how much is, is too much to indulge in because it could become gluttony if it's food. It could become uh, covetousness if you begin to desire and, and get every single color of a certain pair of shoes. Or if you begin to get like every single kind of your favorite 
uh, team sports hat. Like you're becoming uh, covetous. You're becoming materialistic. And that's, that's wrong in God's eyes. So you can't be like, you know, God, I'm doing this for you. No, you're not. You don't wear hats for Jesus. You know, you, you wear it because you want to look good. And it's fine if you need a hat, sure. But if you have a whole, a whole collection and that's what you're about, that's where you're investing your money, it's all for you. That's not for anybody else. So God is saying, you know, be, be a good steward of the money. Be a good steward of the resources he's given you. That's not good stewardship. That's, that's covetousness. That's, that's, that's idolatry. You're pretty much idolizing your, your collection. I had a collection like that of shoes, of hats, and God told me to get rid of it when I turned to him. So when you turn to God, you're going to have to lose things. You're going to have to lose things. And if you don't, you're not getting right with God yet. You know, you can say, you know, Jesus, I love you, but I'm holding on to my gods. I'm holding on to my idols. I'm holding on to my, my wants. I want them still. He's like, well, you know, if you, if you gain the world, you lose your soul. But if you lose your if you lose your life in this world you'll gain your soul so if you continue to hold on to everything that you were raised with or everything you grew up with and nothing changes then uh, if the only change you go through is you begin going to church that's not enough you know that's just participation and there's no participation trophies for heaven you know participants of, of, of church culture don't go to heaven you know, participants in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, those that gave their life to God, those that have received a new life in Christ, they're the only ones that are going to go to heaven faithfully. So over here it's saying that Solomon did what God told him not to. He played around with the wrong people. He got committed to the wrong people. He, he, he gained way too many wives. And uh, he literally uh, began to adopt their spirituality. And they brought on like everything. They brought on all kinds of spiritualities, things that should never have anything to do with the people of God. And they brought him in. And and he just began to like let them burn incense or whatever it was, offerings. He started building altars for these wives, gods, I guess, to respect them. But that's not how you respect somebody. You don't respect somebody by indulging in their sin or approving of it and saying, you know, I mean, it's not me, but you do it. It's cool. That's not how you do it. I can't say, you know, man, uh, you know, this and that, but I'm not going to say nothing. I just don't do it. So I'm going to just respect that you do that. If I realize that somebody's doing something wrong, there's a right way uh, of pointing out that there's something wrong going on. You know, there's a disrespectful way, there's a, there's a snarky way of doing it, but there's also a right way. And we should find the right way by praying and submitting and reading the Word of God. He's going to show you the right way to bring correction and l with love to your friends and family members and people that are walking with God, and people that have no idea who God is, to, to point them towards Jesus. He's going to give you that if you submit to His way. And it might be a way of patience, a way of, of, of waiting for God's timing, but it also might be a way of gently kind of luring people towards the truth so they can make their own choice, but not avoiding you like, oh man, I can't say nothing because then your feelings are going to get hurt. It's like, hurt their feelings, you know? If those hurt feelings lead them to the cross, then they get saved. If they never get their feelings hurt, they are going to have their souls hurt for all eternity if they end up before a God who's not going to care about their feelings, a God who loves them and gave them a choice and they totally rejected him out of straight ignorance and arrogance. He's going to say, you said you rather have hell by rejecting rejecting me and my cross and my sacrifice for you, you're going to end up now in hell. There's no asking for forgiveness now that you have died and you are standing before me, a holy and righteous judge who will judge sin, punish wickedness, and bless righteousness. You have no righteousness that surpasses that of my cross. That's what Jesus is going to say to people. Your righteousness does not surpass my cross. So you can't come in. And I gave you away. I did all the work for you. You didn't have to be righteous enough. You had to submit. And that's all I asked you to do. Submit to my authority because I am the king of heaven. I've created this place. You can't run this show. This ain't for you. That's not what you were made for. You're trying to take my position by ruling over your own life. And that's not what's going to end up in heaven. That's going to end up in hell. That lifestyle choice is going to end up in hell no matter what it looks like. And God is saying, submit, surrender, confess that you have lived in sin against me and I will freely forgive you. Confess it to me. Believe that I died on the cross for you. And because I'm not a sinner, I could have stood back up and I did. Three days later, I got back up and I loved you the whole time. And I wanted you to say yes to me before it's too late. Because one day I will be a righteous judge and I will punish wickedness. And I am right now a graceful father that is forgiving and giving so much mercy and grace and grace and opportunity for you to say, yes, Jesus, you're right. I need you. I'm so 
sorry it took so long to get to you, but here I am. That's all it takes. Be honest, be 100%, and be, be submissive, be reverent to God. So many people try to prove God wrong so they can prove their sins right, but God is still going to say, it's still wrong, it's still wrong, it's still wrong. Stop trying to twist the truth. Just submit to it. Just get honest, get real. Let your heart break open. Let your feelings get hurt, but do something about it. Not trying to just make a better you. Hey, I'm going to do better. I'm going to flip over a green leaf. But what is going to happen with everything that you've done before that? You know, something has to happen for that. That has to be accountable for. You're still responsible for everything that you've done before you decided to get life right. And you can't do it. You can't forgive yourself because you're not the one that was offended. God was. And you still have an account to settle with God. And you don't have enough to pay for it. He paid the whole price. Why try to pay something you can't afford if he already did it for you? That's like walking into the store. The store owner says, I got this. It's on me. Here you go. And you're like, nah, man. I'm going to work my 9 to 5 and I'm going to get it. It's like, you can't afford this. You have no idea how expensive this is. It's like, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. It's like, you won't. You have no idea how expensive this is. The, the owner of the shop has paid for for it and saying you can have this and we're trying to pay it our way he's like you you you'll never have enough to pay for this this is far too valuable there's a price tag that just says too much on this but i've got it for you if you'll just accept it from me but if you try to buy it i'll never give it to you so there's so many people that 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 are scared to lose something for God and and this 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 person Solomon was considered the wisest man in the whole world. God gave him an incredible wisdom, literally incredible wisdom. He wrote part of the book of Proverbs. I mean, <laughs> if you just read some of the Proverbs, you'll you'll be baffled by how incredible they are. And Solomon wrote them and still with all that wisdom, what a decision he made. What an unbelievable decision he made to marry all those women and start actually practicing their style of worship. Worshipping other gods, not the gods that gave him wisdom. Those gods are dead. They're just statues, you know, and, and, and we do that in life. You know, we, we put something on display in our lives, whether it's our own flesh, whether it's our own physique, whether it's our own collection of stuff, whether it's our vehicles, whether it's our clothing style, our haircuts, whether it's our phone, our blingage, whatever it is that we have. We put it on display and we put it on blast and we show it to the whole world and we want to get good reactions so we keep pointing to it and we keep posting stuff about it. It's like, who is your God? What do you post more? You know, people sometimes have their family as their God and their idol and their family is more important to them than the Lord Jesus Christ and they think, you know, family first, Jesus first. Family don't bring you to heaven. Jesus does. He gave you that family. Why would you put anyone before that? And it's not like, it's not like being angry with that, but it's, it's like... If you just take a look at the Word of God, you'll see how wrong it is to put anyone or anything in the number one spot in front of God. You'll see how wrong it is because if you give the wrong kind of glory to the wrong thing, you're really going to have a bad relationship with God. Maybe even a non-existent one, which is horrible. I mean, a bad relationship could be fixed, but a non-existent one needs to actually become Existent. It needs to actually start. And a lot of people think they already have a relationship with God because they're spiritual. Spirituality doesn't mean you know God. It just means you feel a connection to stuff. Spiritual people feel like they are also trees and they're just like trees. They have the same life source. No, they don't. You have the spirit of life in you. Trees don't have that. They just live and God makes them grow. And then they get chopped down. You have an actual purpose. You have an actual, uh, an actual position in God's kingdom. He's not bringing any of this earth into heaven. But all souls will go somewhere, either heaven or hell. Trees just don't matter. Animals, they're going to die. All dogs don't go to heaven. You know, they just die. There's no dogs in heaven. You know? none, of that, none of that is more important than the human soul. And the human soul is literally on the wrong train, going in the wrong direction. God's saying, this is your stop. I need you to get off and turn off in the other direction because that's your only hope. And we're saying, nah, I'm going to just see how much further this goes. I think, it, I think it's going to end up in the right direction. It's like, if you're on this train, the one that you were born on, the one that you kept going on, this is already the wrong train. You have to get off at some point in your life before you die, turn around, get on the other train, and go towards Jesus. Otherwise, there is no train that we are born on or start off our whole lives that's going to curve into the right direction. Everybody starts out going in the wrong direction. No matter how good or how kind or how gentle they are, they still need Jesus. And it's not just about saying, you know, thank you, God. That's not enough. 
Forgive me for my sins against you, Lord Jesus Christ. That is enough if you also submit to him out of that and you are willing to obey him and follow through with things like, for example, one of the most important things after you get, uh, after you s surrender your faith to him and you confess is get baptized in the name of Jesus. Walk down the aisle with God and prove that you are serious about this walk, that you will do something like a public confession. So he didn't do that. He started building altars to other gods. And it's amazing because God gave him wisdom. So he knew, at least at some point, he knew that he was wrong. But he began to idolize his wives enough to actually put God on number two, maybe three. I don't know. Maybe 701 because every one of his wives was more important to him than God. I don't know what position God had in his life at that time. But God says that he was angry with Solomon because he was doing evil in his eyes. I don't know what Solomon's condition is. I don't know what his eternal staying, standing was because he began doing wicked things in God's eyes. And to all the other people in the Bible that have done wicked things like that, God pretty much proved to them, uh, pretty much worded it and explained it that they, they were not going with God when they died. They, they were condemned. I don't know what Solomon's condition was because he ended his life in a pretty bad state. But that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is where are you with God? Are you going to end your life in a good state or a bad state? And since people died all the time, we could see it. Vegas, how many people died at an unexpected time? They were at a festival. There was some kind of a show. And, and no, it wasn't, it wasn't a God-honoring show at all. But they didn't expect to die. They had plans. They had goals. They had unachieved goals. They had short, long, and middle-term goals. They had all kinds of stuff right ahead of them. And they're gone. They're done. How are you going to promise yourself that you're going to live another day? Don't, 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 don't take life for granted. These opportunities you've been given, this is all grace. And God is saying, turn to me now. I love you. I've proven it. You can find out about all of it through my word. You can come to a church that believes and preaches the word of God and hear about it. Or you can ask somebody that claims and lives and really lives the Christ-filled life. And you can listen about their testimony, what God has done in their life. If you want to get to know Jesus, start looking. You already know where to look. A lot of people know exactly where to find Jesus, the Bible and in church. But they refuse to go because they're like, I'm going to figure life out. It's like, you, you won't. Uh, because life has already been written. You don't have to figure it out. Uh, people are still trying to answer, what is life all about? What's the meaning of life? The meaning of life is to worship the Lord God. That's what we've been created for. There's no like additional meaning to life. That's the meaning. How you do it, that's based on what God has given you. Your gifts, your skills, your singing ability, your music ability, your drawing ability, your acting ability. But for God, not to go get be some kind of a superhero in this world and be like the best celebrity. It's like you, you shouldn't be the best celebrity if you're following God. Because if you're actually preaching the gospel while being in any position of, of influence, people are probably going to hate you for it because they hated Jesus for it. That's why they put him on a cross. The Word of God even says, Jesus says, you know, don't worry, if they hate you, they hated me first. If you're going to follow somebody in their path and they get, get taken out and you're still following them, you're probably going to get taken out. At least you're going to get mistreated. At least you're going to get ridiculed because Christ was not appreciated in this world. They didn't hear it or want the message he was preaching. We should be following so much so that people hate us. And that's an incredible thing to call somebody to saying, hey, you know, come, come get saved. Come to church. Come fall in love with Jesus and the whole world's going to start hating you at some point. That's a very incredible welcome statement. But that's it. You know, the life for Christ is not one where you find all your comforts and pleasures in this world. It's one where you know your comfort and pleasure and joy is going to come in the world after. In this one, there are going to be some comforts. There are going to be some pleasures. But for the most part, it's not going to be just all comfortable and pleasure filled. It's going to be sacrifice. It's going to be learning to forgive when you're being treated like garbage, even though you're not doing anything wrong. Learning to ask for forgiveness when you do something wrong. And learning to take God so seriously that when you do wrong things, you're not just waiting for someone to correct you. You're actually listening to God's still small voice so you can ask for forgiveness even if nobody's looking or if that person you've committed a sin against does not forgive you. 
I've asked for forgiveness from God, and I've tried asking for that from that person, but they continue to bring up my wrongdoings, my past, all the time, telling me what, what a wicked person I am. It's like, I've been forgiven by God. Your willingness to, uh, to not forgive me, that's your choice, and that's going to ruin your heart. My heart has been cleaned by the Lord Jesus. Praise God for that. Take God seriously. Don't play games and don't have anybody else before God. Don't put anything else as an idol in your life because God will judge that. And that's not going to be a good relationship. That's like having your wife for men. Have your wife and then get a best friend that's a girl. See how long that works out. You know, you're going to have to lose that. You know, your best, your, your girl, best friend better become your wife like that. Your wife needs to be the female best friend in your life. She needs to be that because she is now your your partner for life, your wife to all men. That uh, there is literally no other way. Like you, you can have friends that are females, but start bringing that distance between it. Keep your testimony pure. Don't get caught in the wrong place you know, so people can start asking questions. You got to start separating and distancing from certain things uh, because that's part of life. Getting married uh, is a part of of spent separating a little bit from some relationships and, and growing intimately with your spouse. That has to happen. Otherwise, there's way too much gray area there and that's dangerous. So uh, God bless you. Read the Bible. Believe it. Repent. Put your faith and your life in Jesus' hands. He will not drop it. He will continue to pick up the pieces as you drop it. So God bless you. Please take it seriously.